thank you all for coming to this uh, meetup. Thanks for uh, staying late. Uh, how many of you don't know me? OK. So I'll go through. Uh, so I'm organizing this group together with Michael. It's been sponsored by a couple of uh, uh, great companies, Pivotal and PayPal. This is the premise. Um, beginning of last year, I abandoned a job at uh, a financial services company, JP Morgan, and joined this startup, which is Pivotal. Uh, thinking about that I will join you know, uh, a unicorn club. Uh, fair enough, I went to Silicon Valley, got the Kool-Aid from the, from the Valley, and then in the, first, in the first meeting that I had with a Fortune 50, you know, I uh, tried my best, got it, all the technical stuff, everything that they need to do, like step by step, and then halfway through the first 10 minutes, everyone was blown away, and then I told to myself, okay, hold on, I need to explain uh, from a level, like from zero level, like what it's actually all the technology, all these buzzwords and like how they can do even the simple stuff. So like teach them how to walk before they begin to run. And uh, I wanted to make this presentation for a long time, continuous delivery and why I think everyone should do it. Because if you're in software business, there's no other way. I mean, survival is not mandatory. So even if you have a safe job now, even if you're like, you know, you have budgets, you have people, hundreds, thousands, it, the disruption is here. So I will not go into a long conversation why you should do it and the disruption is on the door and like, you know, you should feel unsafe. Instead, I'm uh, giving you a glimpse where like you, you can jump along and go through the salvation. <laughs> so the way I want to do it is this is basically a pipeline that we have for one of our pro products. Right, so this is concourse. This is basically how you have the pipeline from the, the simple commit to a delivery in production. So this tool is kind of like, you know, if you go to the technical folks and tell them, okay, forget about all your emails, forget everything. This, just open this dashboard and it will be immediately telling you uh, where, in your, where is your product, which version it is, what's the product, here's the legend. And this is actually happening live and you have multiple builds. I can switch between them. And some of them, they, they are started or green, which is good. Um, but the talk will not be about the technicalities. It's just like, if, if you look at these tools and everything that has been done, it's basically to explain to people why are they doing it and where's the bottleneck. Basically, so that they can actually uh, adopt Kata and then improve where it's stuck or it's not working as fast. The next part is basically, this is cloud.gov. You would probably never expect this in the, your entire life. It's the US government adopting Cloud Foundry as their cloud capabilities. And this is basically the, the setup instruction for uh, a new employee in the government. Basically, how can I set up and get working? And it fits on a page. You don't have to raise you know, num countless of tickets, work for approvals, uh, do all the training sessions, compliance. Relevant. It's basically get an account, install the command line interface, verify that it's actually working so that you have this version, then log in, and you're good to go. This is your sandbox. You can begin improving all the applications under the US government. And this is basically adopted after they failed miserably with their healthcare. And this is literally like the setup page, and I'll actually double check if, oh, so that you, it's under docscloud.gov. So it's authentic. Now, this is my presentation. You can follow along. You can open in your browser. This is the, the stuff that I just pushed. Here's the logs. So this is what I pushed a few minutes ago. So I really iterated very fastly so that I can change the, the way I have my messaging. So let's begin. Continuous delivery, why everyone should do it. This is my Twitter handle. If you want to keep in touch after the meetup or ask me questions. The next one, I'll basically start with the, the objectives of this session. If you do all of this, 
then you can probably do something else through the entire session because it means you've mastered all the concepts, you can do it, and everything is cool. Can you release new features to your customers every week, every day? Can you, do you have the confidence to actually onboard uh, a, new, a new person with the pro on the project and have him commit on his first day and then you know, sleep safe? Confident that, okay, he didn't broke anything. There's not that handoff, which is three months, six months, where like he needs to go with the baby steps until he gets, you know, access to production or access to any product in a meaningful way. That means that that guy within your organization is not able to have a say because for six months he's learning the weeds and probably after the six months he'll find that, okay, I'm probably in the wrong organization. Let me like call my recruiter. Um, definitely it's something that we should all dream, you know, keep it somewhere along our core values. We're like, yeah, we cannot do it tomorrow, but it's something that we should strive for in a year, in two years, in five years. And basically, you know, do small steps. Because this is the, everything that we can hear on the market, the value of going fast, right? Like, Competitor A, B, C can do it faster than us. We need to do it faster. How do we do it? Okay, call, you know, A, B, C, learn how to do it. But ideally is that you cannot put a dollar figure on this fast value. Like, it, you cannot charge the number of servers. It, you cannot charge the number of developers. It's like, it's opportunity cost. Basically, how much do you put a value for a new product that's in, it's on the market and you can deliver like two hours, two weeks, two months before your competitor. Like, what's the opportunity cost? You can only guess work. It, 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 you can uh, make your, you convince yourself that you can actually put a figure in front of it, but it's not, it's not realistic. This is the union, uh, the unicorn club. And this is getting very crowded. So from 2011, January, to July of 2015. This is all the companies that you have on the marketplace that have a valuation of more than $1 billion. And I mean, probably some of them, they are, you, you know, you use. Some of them are no. And even for myself, when I actually opened the Twitter and actually looked at this, I was expecting that it will be Maybe a few, maybe like, you know, I'll have uh, 10, maybe 20 among this lifespan within a year. What it actually means is that you have dozens of Fortune 500 companies that went out of business. Because if you have new players, what happens to the old players? And then you think, okay, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to get my developer. I'm going to go really fast. I'm going to do all these concepts. But then in your mind, you have this strange feeling, okay, it will all go wrong. I'll give, you know, I'll empower this person. I'll give access. I'll do all rules by the book. And then, you know, next day, I will not have a business because, you know, they will fail the business. They will, you know, they will fail miserably. Because, you know, there's so much complexity that we have in software technology. And um, to that being said, yes, there is still complexity. There are many companies that have tried to overcome complexity by different means. And they would, you know, bought expensive tools, uh, paid expensive consultants, had, style, you know, hundreds of checklists, processors, you know, we don't want to have failure in production. But the key to that is that you cannot actually manage complexity you will start with a small product. It will be, you know, you will have a team of five. It will be around this table. Everyone will know what to do with. But soon enough, the, the product will grow. It will be 20 people, 25 people. You cannot have, you'll have to kick people out of your conference call so that you can actually communicate. So it will grow. This is just, a, you know, something that it's reality. And what you can do is something that, you know, Facebook, Google have done. And the way they've uh, done it is, the CTO has thought, okay, what if we can actually optimize for a reversibility? So what if we can always do this continuous delivery, but if we fail, then we can basically 
have a second of that failure. And then we'll basically revert everything very, very fast so nobody will notice. And then over the course of a whole day, you can have hundreds of failures. But if they only take for a, a millisecond, does it matter? Will someone on your client side actually notice that? Be sure it's not. Basically, this is something that uh, was coined at Facebook. And there is, on their tech blog, they actually publish the way they do this reversibility. Is that they were not able to um, overcome complexity, but then they've made it so easy for you to back up any change. And because the change is so small, then it's actually easy technologically. It's easy for a person, it's an API, okay, boom. Something happened, okay, we'll, we'll learn from it. And then you can actually you know, improve on it because imagine if you can do 100 mistakes. Well, you don't have to wait 100 weekends so that you can do it over the weekend when all the IT, instead of going with their family, they have to stay over the weekend because it's, that's the time of the year, of the, of the month, when we can play within our sandbox. And then I will call my wife and tell, okay, me and the boys, we go to do real stuff. And we go into a room, which is war room, and then we have all the dashboards and we can play. And then we have two, two days or, you know, like 48 hours window where we can actually, you know, mess stuff up, learn from it. And usually, like, we have a very small window because the backup and the update of the production takes 24 hours. So it's really, you know, the window for you to make the change is very small. So keep calm and push apps as a service. There's a couple of things that you can do. Basically, you can hire someone you know, who has done it, who has successfully delivered, and then he can do it for you. This is our methodology that we do with Pivotal Labs. And basically, the, the first step we do with delivering a product is we set up a CI CD pipeline. Another use case would be that you can, you start learning. You read books like one, The Phoenix Project, which is by uh, Jean, Jean Kim. And he describes these three ways how you can iterate very fast on your products. So basically, you do this continu continual experimentation and learning. And this is not something new. This is something that uh, Albert Einstein's, many of the professors and innovators, they've done it in the past century, where like, you know, the only reason that Thomas Edison came up with so many innovations, it wasn't because he was the brightest, because he could do more experiments per day than any other uh, physician, any other innovator. So he, he would just practice that and keep innovating. And it's fine if he, he will fail with nine out of 10. If he does 10 experiments, that, that means that one will be successful, while all the others they would do it over multiple weeks, multiple months, because they will wait for papers, for the right process, for the light alignment of the stars. Um, the second is basically the feedback. The only way for you to actually know if it's successful, it's not if your manager tells you, okay, good job, if it's the market, if it's the client, if someone who is using your application is actually telling you, yes, I like it. And you can actually see it in the when you push an application in, you, in the App Store. You know, you'll have reviews, bad or good, but at least you'll have feedback. It just happens that for many applications that are pushed into the App Store in the mob mobile space, after the first day, after the marketing budget ended, it's gone in the oblivion because nobody is looking at it. And the last is the flow. And this is by a um, sport coach with a very hard name where he basically talks about this flow state where you have innovators, which are your engineers. And the way they can get into the flow is the same like you know, some, some days of the week, you know, where you don't get any interruption. And you just you know, literally are working on something like you know, for two hours. And then at the end of the two hours, you see a result. And then, whoa, you know, this made my day. This is something that you know, I accomplished, I would have accomplished for a week. And then there are other days where like, you have constant interruptions, you have constant meetings. And even though you are efficient, you have calendars, buzz, assistance, like the end result, well, that was a wasted day. Nothing, nothing came out of you know, that, uh, that date that will influence your company. 
And this flow state is basically where you get to work uninterrupted on something very difficult. Because the time and the context that you need to get in order for you to uh, develop something meaningful, it's, you know, it's eight hours. So you literally don't need to be interrupted by calls, by WhatsApp messages, alerts, emails, manager coming with or your peers. It's just, and that's the flow state. Now, how, do you, how can you enable the fast feedback? Well, you know, we adopt Agile, and then we do it every two weeks. But it's not, it's not only that case, because it's actually, you have to release less change more often. This is the main attitude that you should take with your product. It's not that you do it every two weeks and you still deliver the same mess. It's actually, you know, you start delivering small incremental changes. And they will have a low risk. And you can do it more often and more often. So from 12 months to a quarter to a month to a week to a day. The myth in uh, Amazon, or at least it, it, they go by, is that not only on the first day you actually commit something to production, but you, you have 13 releases per second. So it constantly changes. And if you think about it, it's like, well, it, that could be impossible. But if you think about all the products that they have in their catalog, all the things, all the services that they do, there will be someone in a region on a product that will want to make a change. And they do it because it's possible. It's just if the person wants to do that change and make the improvement. So continuous integration and delivery, right? So I think we got it. This is what we need to do. OK, every, every grant in the organization begins speaking, you know, having the flag continuous integration, delivery, continuous integration, delivery. And then you start having, you know, agilist. The, the only way that you can do it is we all go agile, right? Everything, you know, from top to bottom, you know, it's, uh, raises the banner of being agile. If you're not agile, you're not with us. So it's a nice, nice image. Or it's DevOps. Everywhere it's like, okay, it's DevOps. If you're not DevOps, it's not going to work. We're not going to do continuous delivery or, you know, we're going to be out of business. Everywhere, right? Everywhere is DevOps. We all do DevOps, starting from the CFO. Even CFO has, a, has an access to production, right? So he can push changes to production. Or you go, it's all about design. It needs to be this, you know, nice design where we go in, into the ivory tower and we finalize our design and everything is OOP. Everything is object-oriented, has all the principles, all the practices. Everything that will push into production needs to be uh, checked by our chief architect. And this is my best. It's actually taking, uh, this is by model IT. We need to find the right ratio between our old staff and new staff so that we can deliver very fast. <laughs> And you notice the green guy. Oh. <laughs> so honestly, you know, these this sort of things where like there is a magic ratio where like, you know, we have two parts of our infrastructure landscape and they all have to be aligned. It never works. Maybe on a paper, maybe on a Gartner analyst report, you know, again, if we've done enough research, if we've got it uh, and asked all the right CIOs, then the percentage will be right and we'll move and align to that strategy. So I think it's not one. It's actually three, four, even more things that are come together. And it's very important to understand that it's actually only if you combine you know, these practices, these people, the products, then the sum of the others will be much larger than uh, you know, arithmetically. This is the same where they teach you that 1 plus 1 doesn't equal 2, but it's actually 10. Because if everything works together, if everything is in that flow, then you can actually iterate faster. It iterate much faster for your company. You get to join the, uh, the unicorn club. And let me just read through. So you have to work on a product, but that product is not your average project. 
you, you don't get to assign project resources, you do it, but it's very much you iterate. So the only way for you to, to build something meaningful if you iterate on it. So that product is continuously improved. You know, you get feedback from your clients, you get feedback from everybody in the organization. As long as you work on a product, then that means that you can actually deliver value. Of course, process. But process is not, you know, Agile, Kanban, or any other. It's a process that works for your organization. It's adapted to the knowledge that is in your organization. You cannot send 10,000 people to an Agile or Scrum certification. After two days, they come all certified and you know, nothing happens because they, well, they learned how it works in other organization and they are back into your organization and it's like, okay, well, I need this. And you find all the excuses that you see in the world. So you need to adapt the process and basically improve the process. And of course, it's about people. And I'm not talking about people that, you know, have been born, you know, like they do in uh, many other cultures. You have to be born, have the astrological sign, be in, you know, have this sign. And then if your project manager also uh, by the stars is in that sign, it's like a Leo, and then it's born in the year of the dragon, then you will work together. Uh, it's, it's basically people who understand that they can, they can make a change. And if you look at all the unicorn clubs, they don't get new people, new clone people, right? You don't see Zuckerberg and then clones of Zuckerberg doing all the other startups. It's actually people from the same industry, like former, your former peers that have developed this learning process where they constantly improve and they constantly uh, adopt new practices. And that's what keeps them ahead. It's, you know, meetups, conferences, blogs, hacker news, whatever. Whatever that keeps you updated because you need to be in that constant learning. So let me give you a couple of definitions. What do I mean by continuous integration? It's basically having a trunk and merging the dev to the trunk. So you on, always have, you know, one one trunk based, one single truth in your code base. So you don't have multiple branches, people, you know, with one part of the truth, other people with, you know, another small branch of the truth. It's like one truth. And then you can basically iterate on it because if you look at the way your clients use, they use one single product. So then it makes sense that you also maintain one single truth about it. Then you basically have build service that automates this stuff. So it's not about having green KPIs, how many percentage of uh, specific tests. It's really, you know, keeping the obvious for the whole group. Like if we are working on a new feature, on a new product, here it is. This is the source code, git clone, and you have it. If you want to make changes, this is where you do it. Just make sure you leave it green after you've done your changes. Continuous delivery. This is basically once you've know that that source code is at a specific location and that is the true for everyone, then you start doing a staged approach where you move it to dev where there is, you know, a sandbox. You know, you don't have big servers, you don't have uh, integration or latency test. And then you move to, let's say, a UAT, where you basically integrate with the larger picture of the whole organization. And then you probably will find bugs, errors, things that were not thought before, that were not present in your development environment. And then you'll move to a pre-prod environment, where it's very realistic to what will happen to production, where you have you know, uh, data. It's not mock-up data, but it's data that is very realistic to your production. And things that you you, you will not uh, be able to predict on the first stage because your production environment could be running for a year, 20 years. You could have legacy products that, you know, not many have a context. And this is very much important about your organization that I'll go back to the complexity. You, you may start small. Your product may have microservices, but it will outgrow. It will happen that you know, you have maybe three people who really understand how everything suits together. Um, so the story is, once I joined a big bank 
I, I've started asking myself, okay, so what's the process? How do I do this, that? And uh, soon enough, they, they sent me to all these different people, sent tons of emails, get to chat with uh, IT, DBAs, release managers, change managers, portfolio managers, you know, because I wanted to make a simple release. And then at the end of my journey for about like three months, well, I said, okay, now I get it. I understand what our product does in the big or the larger scheme of things. And then people look at me, oh, really? Okay, so you, we only had three people in the whole organization who knew about the product and the whole life cycle. So we'll now add you to the fourth. So you'll be the fourth person. And you know, to me, that was like an enlightenment. Okay, so now I get to work on real stuff. Instead, I was put on a big mailing list where I received even more mails. For people asking, you know, questions from what happens with the logging, what happens with the monitoring, like stuff that I couldn't actually bring any value because I was connected to the fire hose. So you would have all the people asking so many questions. And even for me, you know, the, that counter on the mailbox keep incrementing. So from, you know, the first week a thousand, next week two thousand, and, you know, I, I you know, I was doing my best to actually reply and, you know, help people to understand. But if the people with whom you work don't take that learning approach to, you know, start being curious and uh, learn for themselves and they stick to their silo approach where like, where well, I'm just a brick in this world. This is what they do. You know, if you move him to another part, okay, I need six months or three months of onboarding. Okay. To so continuous deployment is then basically the final of it. It's where you, you don't need people overseeing your build. You don't need people, you know, you don't even actually have people who are managing your product. It's basically an API for it. It's something where you go, push a button, and it, it just happens. And then you say, okay, that's good. So continuous deployment is you know, you have one single truth, it goes through that stage approach from dev to production, and you know, the only thing that you have is once you commit it, and it probably could happen something really bad, you, you, you just have a push and a rollback button. That's it. So keep calm and push applications as a service, because this is the only thing that you can actually add value on your organization. Everything as a service. Like you can look in the market and there will be a service for everything, even for chair as a service, right? There will be an API, a mobile app, someone to call that will give you a JSON, which will have all the details about this chair or about this table. Because this is how we're moving. We are moving now into a, a new era where we have the internet of things, where basically what will happen is I will go to my home the electricity will light up, my uh, uh, fridge will start talking to me, talking about news, and then I'll open the fridge, it will have the right amount of calories, the salad will be there, I will not have to open beers, like everything will be there. You know, just internet of things. Because they will know so much things about myself and everything will be API controlled that will, will leave almost a ubiquitous world where like we have, you know, uh, a big entity that stores our metadata as adjacent, and then you keep interacting with APIs around the world. Is it a relational database? There could be. I will have my IC, I will still have to go to the person. So I, I go to the custom tree US, I will still have to pass that kit. Um, so, okay, if we move to everything as a service, let, I'll uh, keep it very simple. Let's think about the way we uh, innovated with electric cars. The model was very easy, you know. As a consumer, I'm interested to keep my uh, price for gas per mile as low as possible. And if you remember the whole story about Elon Musk and the Tesla, it, was, it almost went bankrupt. It was very expensive at, at start. But he still had the confidence because the oil industry and the energy industry was there for 100 years. And there was no more innovation. And then the innovation began with, you know, let's make an electric car. Instead of putting, you know, as, as many computers on our 
you know, hybrid car and it will have too many, sen many sensors over it. What if we could build a car that at the center of it has a computer and then we put the wheels on it? So then everything is API driven. And soon enough, of course, the prices went down. Of course, all the other industry you know, realized that electric car is the future and we will all have electric car, we'll have even driverless car. I think what you can see in the, in the industry is that it's so easy to look at, th at things in the past and make the realization that, yes, this is how it should be. But if you remember, like a few years back, it almost went bankrupt. This is what happens in our daily life. It's not like it's a flow. It's a continuous flow. It's not that, you know, from day like anno domini, you know, this is changed and this is like the right point in time where the whole industry from 99% who were using uh, oil now changed to electric. There's of, there's of course a point of time where you know, there's enough crazy people who believe that this change is the right way. Let me give you another example about the, the way we do IT software with an example about Cara SSS. So, on the left, we are very, you know, it's very easy for us to, to relate. It's basically, I own a car. Now that you are all in Singapore, you know that this is not a reality. This is not how people in Singapore move around. Mm -hmm. So then you start thinking about, okay, what if we can lease the infrastructure and make this infrastructure as a service? So then we have this managed by the client and managed by the service provider, where we manage the servicing, the renewables, insurance, road tax, garage fuel, road tax driver, and we basically lease it for 10 years. And we participate in a bidding where like, we get to use a car for 10 years. Well, that's one way. What about the next way where like, we actually start thinking about more of a platform where we, instead of worrying about you know, um, servicing renewable, ab about the technicalities of it, we are not all mechanical engineers. We don't need to know everything about the car and go, you know, once, once a Friday, uh, put a bolt on it or, you know, change something in the, in the engine because this is the reality. We, we have our day job and we focus on what we deliver at best and we specialize in a specific need where the market pays us, you know, uh, you know a good wage that we don't want to all go back into the garage and become mechanical engineers or auto service. This is platform as a service where you have, the only need that you do is basically put fuel, road tolls, and be the driver, right? Have a license. Now, the ultimate goal is basically my Uber app where I don't need to worry where I park my car. I don't need to worry about fueling. I don't even know where's the, net, you know, the, the closest petrol station. Call point A to B. This is software as a service. Now, why am I um, bringing all of this in terms of, I work for a software company. I work for uh, a software company many years ago, uh, Adobe. And then I joined a financial services company because I thought, you know, I'll be able to make a change because I learned so much and, you know, they will understand the technology is all about it. So I'll go into a, a bank and make it a new bank because it's just technology. Soon enough, I found out that it's actually the people. <laughs> people don't want to, to change. There is a, a good joke uh, where, you know, you, you have this recurrent question, like, how many people do you need to change a light bulb? Well, the, now within the industry, the recurrent joke is that it's enough to have one person, but the light bulb needs to want to change. So he needs to be, you know, to believe in that, and he needs to, to know and want to change. So we at Pivotal, we have, we go by a mantra. We don't just transform how you build software. We believe that software is now so ubiquitous that you can only iterate. You don't only build once and then, you know, that will be for decades. You actually keep iterating. So then it's all about those three pillars of continuous delivery. People, process, product. And 
this is like a good example of how we actually iterate on software in any, in any organization. We begin with a light bulb, an idea. We start writing something, you know, could be a, you know, a story, could be a note, could be something that you record a message on your, you know, on your assistant and then pass it to the developers. Soon enough, you start building software. But the only way for you to know when you're actually finished, if you also build tests, right? Like, what am I building? What is the end goal? When do I know that, you know, what I'm building is finished, it's done? Then once you do the whole testing, you know, you deploy it, right, fine enough. And then once you deploy it, you have people, so you got the feedback. It might not be good. It's, you know, people keep forgetting that it's not about the technology where, you know, I can deploy 100 times per second or, you know, every week. It's still about the feedback. It, are you building the right stuff? Because we build organization where, like if you look at our organization is, we have dev, we have DBAs, we have testers, and they are all building. They go every day and they build stuff. Eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. And they do it as fast as they can and they go to the certifi certification so that they build even faster. The, the broken part is that the end goal or the feedback, they never see it. So they don't know if they build the right stuff or not. Even if, you know, at their position, it's not that they want to fail the company or, you know, waste the company money or go bankrupt. If you go to any, you know, to any engineer or employee of, a co of your company, he doesn't wake up in the morning and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something bad in my company. I'm gonna work for eight hours, you know, just to break, to set everything on fire. No, it's like, you know, you go there, you work even more, especially in Singapore, you work more than eight hours, for sure. Now, one of the reasons that CloudGov is using Pivotal software is that we are big believers in open source. And actually we, you know, set a tool in the open source space where you can actually get and use it. Because we believe that you know, any company that builds products, if it's not building it in the open source community, then it just, um, uh, it's lying to yourself because the only way for you to get a real feedback, not from, you know, analysts where you have a, maybe a monthly call, you know, about the yearnings. It's really, if it's there in the open source, you have a community because community will bring diversity, diversity will bring new ideas, it will bring feedback. This is Pivotal Tracker. We think that you know, it's a good Kanban board where you can actually write your stories and iterate on it and you have this visu uh, great visual. This is Spring Framework, uh, the namesake of this user group. We believe that it's a great choice for you to build microservices. This is Concourse, a great CI tool, which you know, the pipeline I showed you in the beginning where it has everything visual for you. What's failing, what's starting, what's pending. And this is Cloud Foundry. The only way you should deploy so software, my, in my humble opinion. And I'm biased, I'm biased, but I challenge you, find a better tool. Uh, change your organization. If you do it even better, then we'll, we'll live in a better world, right? And gather as much feedback from anywhere, anytime. Keep calm and push application as a service. Here's my source code, run it on the cloud for me. I do not care how. This is a haiku by uh, uh, Onsi Fakuri, the vice president of engineering for Cloud Foundry and Spring R&D. Questions, comments? I think this is the 
becoming more and more of a topic. Maybe it's a bit of a philosophical question, but uh, how do you then separate really software from the, the, the thing, whatever it is? I think as long as you have an API, that can, you can always opt out. If you don't like it, don't use it. You know, it's the same as you have the policy with uh, how many of you like to receive calls from marketers, recruiters. That's why the government of Singapore established do not call policy, right? If you like by any chance to be called on a daily basis every hour, then you don't need to put your phone in the do not call registry. But if you want to enjoy, you know, your, so I think it's all about opt-in and opt-out. As long as you have an API, you're given a choice. If you don't have it, there's no choice. Yeah, I, I think your presentation was fantastic. Uh, I just um, have, a, have a, this situation where sometimes uh, we work in teams, but uh, we, we find out that the product manager is not very sure what he wants. So what happens is a lot of times we are trying things, we are HR, we are trying all these things, but then because he's not sure what he wants, and then he kind of feels that things are being wasted. So how do you address that? I think it's very, like, I, I have two kids, and uh, you know, when they are small, they don't run, they crawl. They actually fall a lot. And then, you know, my, my uh, take on it was like, I'll build cushions everywhere in my house and everywhere like it'll be like, it's constant. You cannot babysit a project. It, and it's fine if you fail. It's fine if you, you know, deliver something that it's not 100% the best that you can do it. It's fine to fail. You just learn from that exercise. Don't repeat it. I think that's where kata, that's where the uh, reversibility principle is. As long as you have, you know, a fail safe, within your production. You know, it's fine if your version 1.1 is worse than your version 1. You can always go back to that version, right? So you'll, you'll do it, you'll learn, hopefully you'll learn something for it, and then you'll improve on version 1.2. Um, so actually Cloud Foundry has uh, A-B testing in built into it where like it, it becomes really easy for you to segment the traffic and you have concepts like you know feature toggle that makes it easier for you to have multiple uh, versions within production because this is how the big guys are doing it if you look at Facebook Twitter or you know that they segment the traffic is they the way they got the feedback it's not that, you know, we'll pick, you know, Monday for users in Europe. We'll pick Tuesday for users in, they actually do it 24 by 7. They say, okay, so if your IP is from this address, you'll be given this experience. You'll be given the other experience. It's actually for you to segment the traffic. As long as you, you make it an API driven, where, you know, you have a single source of truth which is your software, but then you allow feature toggles to give you know a certain experience if the conditionals are right. Don't go and build different products. I think it's one of the worst mistakes that you can do is actually um, integrate configuration and code in the same repository and then have multiple versions where like you know for a specific use case, go to software A. For another experience, go to software B, C. Because then you don't have a product, then you don't have a single source of truth, then you probably will fix version one, but you'll not fix the others. And then soon enough, you'll go into that round and circle. Well, you keep fixing things and you don't know what's happening. You don't know, the, you know what, if you're really doing the proper thing. Uh, I mean, everything is chart based, but you just provide hooks for, for making, making... Yeah, uh, feature toggles, traffic segmentation. It's, it's not necessarily something that, you know, it's by history. Like, um, 
So I, I mentioned that I work for Adobe. So in Adobe, I work for a company, uh, for Omniture business unit. And one of the products that we're building were the uh, marketing campaign tools. So back in the year of 2008, we're able to segment traffic for different customers. And then what you would be given is an endpoint, you know, a UR software as a service, and then you'd be inser inserting a JavaScript. And then based on your profile, you define targeting. You define different experience. And then you'll traf target you know, an audience and then deliver one experience. And then you'll just be able to control via your targeters. And I think we, we build a good product because up until this day, Adobe Marketing Cloud is uh, the leader. So this, this, this change is that uh, Facebook is, is delivering this uh, small, very small increment. Uh, I think this is something that they only can do because they have such a large user base. And, and honestly, I think if something goes wrong, it's so small that nobody will realize it, but they still have enough traffic to actually significantly understand whether uh, a change has gone wrong. Um, if you have a small user base, you probably can't do that. And it also depends on the user base uh, that you, if you produce something that would upset the client very much, you would not be able to, to do this kind of pattern, right? Sure, sure. So, you know, it's like probably in my first week or month in the job, the, the most often answer that I would get from IT, no, just don't do it. It's impossible because A, B, and various excuses. But if you look through the, you know, even how we release products in financial services, you still have that help desk call. And then you call that number, and then if something went wrong with your transaction, then they will be able to log in in their mainframe system and then reverse it back. So there, there's no such thing that we cannot fix it. It's the way that we think about it is that there needs to be a person at the end of the call. You know, there needs to be a person who will be overseeing these emails and it's this distribution group. Or, you know. But the problem is it's very hard to scale people. You know, at any time, I'll be able to reply to one person. And what happens if I have you know, 100 users, 1,000 users? And this is my single point of failure. The moment I have an API, then it's just a matter for me. Of course, it could be wrong. You know, it, it will not be uh, successful from day zero. But like you said, in the iteration 88, I'll probably hit the jackpot. And this will be the API that everyone will use it. The same way we thought about internet and online banking. How many people were like using online banking when it appeared and said, like, nobody's going to do any transaction on web, which is ridiculous. Or even the code from IBM, where like, there will be five machines worldwide that will be used. Like, nobody else can need or needs to use a computer. There will be five machines worldwide. Or there's enough memory, you know, this uh, 512 bytes that everyone needs for, for RAM by Bill Gates. So keep iterating, Kata and the court. And I think uh, for all intents and purposes, um, and I give this advice to a lot of people who come and ask, like, on what should I focus, what should I learn is, you know, find something really challenging, find something really difficult to do and get, get it done. Because you'll spend the same amount of time and hours doing something unmeaningful, reinventing the wheel. Instead, you are giving this time frame that you better use on something that is meaningful for you, for your company, for your family. Stop wasting your time. Right? Where it's like, I'm going to go and reinvent the wheel. Like, how many people go and reinvent the wheel on their daily basis? Honestly, I, uh, I think that's the problem where like, people think in uh, 
black and white, that there are people who want to improve and there are people who don't want to improve. There's actually a gray area. And not necessarily everyone will find it very interesting you know, to learn about Java, Spring, Concourse. But they will definitely find something in the STEM research, biomed, tech, even like you know, how to make a better toy for their kids. And as long as they find something really interesting, you know, meaningful, like you can always take from people. You cannot give and, you know, they, they, need, they need to want something really so that they can actually make it as part of, uh, they need to own it. Like this is wha one of the reasons where like you send people for certifications, <laughs> you get zero value and you'll only get value from those people who really believe it and they wanted to sign up for that learning session, for that certification. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, <laughs> last slide. So this is run.pivotal. I mean, the best way you would go to this slide, and then you have the link for the presentation. Hello-cd.cfapps.io. And then if you are a technologist and you want to make a change within your product, then there is this great workshop done by my colleague, Carlos, who left, migrating a monolith application to cloud native. But for the interest in is, this is how you, this is a great session by Onsi Fakuri, where he talks about how you iterate on software. This is a great session by Josh Long, where he <coughs> live codes an application for one hour from scratch. And the end, end result is amazing on what you achieve in one hour. And the last but not least is Concourse, which I think will, will change the way we build software. Thank you.